GFS implementation briefing this morning, which lasted about three hours, was supposed to be two, and it will be implemented. Uh, I think there was fair, pretty significant level of concern that was expressed by a number of those on the call, the Hurricane Center in particular, but it was decided that We'll go ahead and implement and try to work judiciously to account for some of the erratic inconsistencies we've seen with it, even versus the GFS operational. So, um, but some of, some of those of you who participated on that, thank you. I'm assuming the script's running then. Sometimes it takes a few minutes. Yeah, do you see anything uh, on your screen? Not yet. We still see, I still see John Ice's screen. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. I closed that off. Um, I, I see them actually right now. Am I the only one that's hosed up? Um, I don't know. Can anybody else verify they can see the uh, the screen from WPC? Hey guys, this is Chris. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's on. It just came up now. Yeah, yeah same here. Okay. Okay. Yep. Sometimes yeah, this, uh, the PWPF. Do you have it yet? Yeah, it's on my screen I, now. I, I, for me, I don't see it. I, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and come back in. I'm doing the winter weather webinars. The joint is so slow, some people gave up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I see it now. As soon as I closed, for those of you that had that problem, I closed it and I came back in and it immediately went to Mark's screen. It's interesting. Sorry about that. Hey, good afternoon. Hey, it's uh, Dave Novak here at WPC. Just wanted to uh, uh, thank you for setting this up, Jeff, and uh, you know working with us here on this side. And you know, I think we all kind of view this as a discussion. Uh, so I hope it can be. You know, we're hoping to have a, enough time for discussion. But did want to just present a, a few. Uh, uh, a few slides here on uh, PWPF and, and other aspects. All right, so let me get started here. Jeff, you've already seen this presentation, or most of it, uh, back in September. Uh, it's not too much changed since then. Uh, basically, we're just going to give an overview of what the PWPFs are and a little bit of the discussion about how they're constructed and also uh, a case example of comparing uh, membership from last year to this year and what changes took place. Um, a lot of you probably already are familiar with this. Uh, our PWPFs consist of two major products, uh, probabilities of snow and freezing rain exceeding um, set thresholds, one inch, two inches, four inches, and so forth, and also the percentile accumulations. Typically, uh, a lot of people use the 10th and 90th as sort of the min and max uh, idea of, of an event. Um, our forecasts are created in uh, 12, 24, 48, and 70, 72 hour uh, periods and they're in uh, rolling six hour time steps so you get a for a 24 hour you get a 0 to 0, a 6 to 6, a 12 to 12 Z uh, product. So it's a good way to be able to get a sense of your highest pro period of highest probabilities or accumulations. Basically the they're created using a deterministic forecast, our 24-hour accumulations of snow and freezing rain, and then the uncertainty is brought in uh, by the uh, numerical model uh, ensembles, uh, both U.S. and uh, Canadian and um, European ensembles, along with some other deterministic model runs. Currently, all of the products are at 20 kilometers. Uh, there is some discussion of reducing that uh, to a lower 
um, to a higher resolution. I'm not sure exactly the timing of that. And again, the products are available in GRIP2, KML, and GIF image format. Um, so really when we're talking about the PWPFs, we're looking at three areas of, of uncertainty. Um, similar to just the PQPF, you obviously have the QPF of the models varies from uh, member to member. But in addition to that, we have issues with precipitation type, since that varies uh, from member to member. And also another area of uncertainty is the snow to liquid ratio. So the idea with the PWPFs is to try to address these uh, using our multi-model ensemble. And taking a look at actually what makes up the ensemble, it's a 58-member ensemble. Uh, the members that are in orange are you know, U.S. operation or U.S. models. Uh, the models in black are uh, Canadian, essentially just the Canadian and the European. Uh, and the big change for this year, this season, was the addition of 25 randomly selected European ensemble members uh, out of the 50. Um, so that is the major change from last year, which had 33 members, to this year, which has uh, 58. So, you know, QPF is, we just pull that out of each ensemble member, so we're able to get that. Uh, as far as precipitation type, um, from the U.S. models, we're able to use the dominant precip type that exists as an output variable from the SHREF, NAM, uh, GFS, and the ensembles. Um, you, I think it's using four or five different algorithms, and it picks the dominant P type. Um, from the European and Canadian, we don't have as many fields uh, in the vertical, so we do a, sort of a simple thermal calculation to determine the P type using surface. 925, 850, and 700 millibar temperatures. And overall, it was found that this ends up agreeing with uh, the dominant peak type about 95% of the time. So it's, it's not perfect, but it certainly is a, is a pretty good proxy. And then the snow to liquid ratio calculation. Um, the way that this is currently done is it's an arithmetic mean of, we apply the ROBER method to the NAM and the GFS. Um, the third, in, uh, third member of this uh, group is the Baxter seasonal climatology and then a very simple 11 to 1 ratio. So essentially that grid is calculated and then applied to each of the ensemble members. Uh, so this does not vary across the members. Uh, it's simply a single grid that's applied at the moment. Um, so the SLR is calculated at each point, and then the accumulation is determined by multiplying the SLR by the QPF for the preceding period. So the SLR is determined at the end of the valid period of the six-hour accumulation, and then it's multiplied by the six, whatever the six-hour QPF is up to that time. Okay, and there's a little example there at the bottom. And also, if you really want to read a lot more about the Rover method, um, there's plenty of examples at the bottom. So just going to talk a little bit uh, about the statistical methodology. Um, this was a, a probability distribution that was, is currently used for our PQPFs. Um, it's basically, we found that, and it's true, that QPF is not in, is not, does not, cannot be represented by a simple normal distribution. You tend to have a lot of low values uh, clustered, and then you might have a break, and then high values. So it's not going to be a normal distribution. So we had to figure out a way to be able to construct the, the PDFs in a way that was computationally reasonable in terms of time, and also accounted for um, zero values, which it needs to, because the fact is there is a non-zero probability uh, that you will have no precipitation. So this binormal curve has turned out to work, has worked out pretty well for us with the PQPFs, and it was applied with the PWPFs. Essentially, the concept of the binormal is two normal curves, uh, and they're meeting at the mode. Uh, so you can, 
wherever the mode is placed, you can have different variances. So versus a normal distribution where the variance is the same on either side, you can have a different variance on the left or right side of the mode with the binormal. And the determination of the mode is our accumulation forecast. Our 24-hour accumulation forecast becomes the mode is essentially considered the most probable or most likely solution. That's the concept. And then the variance is determined by the uh, 57 members that are, or 58 members, including ours, of the distribution. Um, again, this is all done on a 20-kilometer grid, and once all of this, once these PDFs have been uh, calculated, our probabilities exceedance and the accumulations fall right out of that, all our products. Uh, kind of a way to view this visually a little bit more easily is let's say we just are taking a, a single grid point here, um, and this is your distribution of, say, of the 58 members. So we have snowfall accumulation increasing to the right and probabilities, you know, pr whatever the frequency probability um, is on the vertical axis. And so what we have is some runs of the ensemble are going with low accumulation, some are kind of going higher, and at this grid point we are kind of being a little bullish and going with a higher amount. Um, so what ends up happening when the PDF is created is something like this. So our forecast accumulation becomes the mode um, becoming the most probable solution, and then that the variance is determined by the um, by the red by the distribution of the ensemble. So essentially, as you saw, there were a lot more lighter values um, in that example in the previous slide. So there's definitely this is more of a left skewed. There's a lot there's more variance on the left side of this, this distribution than the right. Okay, um, now. The PWPFs, the ter well, let's kind of go back a little bit here. Basically, we create a deterministic forecast. Uh, day one to three, 24-hour accumulations of uh, snow and freezing rain. This is not the same. Um, in any case, initially, the, the um, I'm sorry, I'm getting, I got a little bit uh, tied up here, but uh, anyway, the QPF for this deterministic forecast is currently generated uh, using, we're collaborating with our QPF desk, um, but it does come out of a preferred model blend, and then the forecaster also gets to choose the uh, blend of uh, models for the precipitation type. So once that goes out, once they have chosen that, you get the deterministic forecast printed out, and then the forecaster has the ability to go in and modify the contours before, before sending out the final product. As far as the PWPFs are concerned, that is a fully automated on the back end. All of those products fall essentially out of um, you know, their, determin their deterministic forecast uh, once you go through the post-processing period. So, right this, is not the right, this is not the right presentation. Um, so, uh, so how about at, at this point, are there any, maybe you want to try to pull up your other, yeah. are there questions maybe at this point, so uh, well, Mark's pulling up uh, a recently modified presentation, I guess. Yeah, this is Matt and Rapid City, I have, I have a couple short questions. Uh, for the ECMWF uh, random ensemble members, is that, are they randomly chosen every day or do you just, as you pick them randomly once and you just go with that? Uh, they're randomly chosen each cycle. Okay. So they're not, then they're the, not the other going question to be the same. Maybe you'll get to this in your presentation, but if you look at the 90th percentile or, or even the max, how well is that uh, calibrated? Meaning, um, are there a lot more, you know, is it more than 10% that the actual observed max snow is going to be above that? So, in other words, if, if we put the 90th percentile or the max, and can we really say that's the worst case scenario and have some confidence about that? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, it is fairly reliable, believe it or not. So, uh, at least from the verification that we did uh, in the eastern half of the United States where you have reliable uh, co-op um, is, is what we did. Um, and we found, I'm trying to remember, I think Mark will have it in his paper, 
or in uh, in it a slide been here. A slide, actually, you want me to just go to that real quick? Sure. Um, it was it was Keith and I remember thinking, now oh, this is yeah, here almost is. too good to be true. Um, in that middle slide there, I'm not sure if you're able to see that. Yeah, but, can you guys uh, see that, or is that too small? The reliability testing. Yeah. Yes. It's it's I can see it. It's a little small, but I can see it. Yeah, we'll, we'll download it here. Point here is it was, uh, you know, it was basically within, you know, a few percentage points of being very reliable. Any idea how, uh, for areas like here in Black Hills where you have upslope or, or the west of the higher terrain, uh, any differences noted f for those areas? A really good question. Um, you know, honestly, it really depends on the analysis. Uh, and you know when we did our, our our reliability testing, you see here those are the variety of different um, cocoras. I, I think they're co-op observations here um, that had reliable uh, observations throughout an entire winter season. So um, you know it's a number of cases, but you know notably there's not very many in the northern plains or out west. Um, so you know and th these were at points. Um, what you really want, of course, is a gridded analysis, and we're not quite there yet. So, uh, so frankly, it's it's hard to say. Um, I think that'd be a wonderful local study. Uh, you know, if you have you know reliable observations in your CWA, it'd be wonderful to learn you know how how reliable we are at those at those stations with the with the percent test. Okay, thanks. All right. Well, that was a. Now that we've had that short break, um, let me just go to an example here of a recent case, and I, I know this is in the east uh, and happens to be centered over our area, but you know, forgive us for that because this just happened to have a fair amount of data and we had some time to look at this uh, in, the, in the last several days. But basically, we're looking at a 24-hour probabilistic forecast. This was the official forecast. Uh, that would have gone out uh, in the grip files or the you know, on the website, um, and this is for probability 24 hour probability of snow greater than four inches for 60 the 30th of December through 60 the 31st. So this is the official forecast. Now that's the 58 members. If we look at just the 32 member ensemble, this would have been this is the ensemble that would have existed last year. Uh, so this would have actually been the forecast you just saw, or mostly the forecast you just saw, uh, if, if we had had the same membership as last year. The SHREF in this case was rather bullish with the event and had quite a few members that were predicting uh, greater than four inches. You see there's actually a stripe of 30 to 40 percent uh, going up through northern Virginia into northern Maryland and southern New Jersey, um, which is a lot higher than the 10 to 15 percent that was in the official forecast. And the reason for that is the European. This is the 20, this is the 25 members, again, randomly chosen that day. This is what the, uh, those members considered the probability. They essentially did not have much of an event. It may have been less than four inches. I'm not 100 percent sure of that, but uh, definitely only a few members were considering greater than four inches, and even that was only over a portion of the area. Um, so that's what ended up happening, or the, that was the members. Now this is, a, this is our forecaster. This is the deterministic forecast from WPC. So we were leading toward, clearly, uh, a non-event in this case and going against the SHREF. So just to kind of compare here, down on the bottom right is the official forecast, which was from the first slide that I sh uh, showed. The one on the left is taking out the WPC forecast. So this would be 57 members. And you see what the WPC forecast did have an impact on the probabilities. The, there was still a stripe of 20 to 30 percent there in northern Virginia and a rather large area of 10 to, 10 to 15, uh, or 10 to 20 percent, I'm sorry, uh, that still existed over us. and. Um, just, just having the WPC forecast in there and skewing the, the PDF resulted in a pretty, uh, definitely a forecast that was headed in the right direction. Um, I don't think anything fell in this case exactly. Um, so, but this is just an example of how the membership of the ensembles from this year versus last year uh, and how our deterministic forecast kind of comes into play 
uh, to have some impact on the probabilistic product in the end. And that actually was going to be the last thing I showed. Yeah, let's go back there. I, I imagine this might raise some questions. Um, so in essence, and I think this is what we've been hearing from Central Region as well as other WFOs is, you know, how can you have a 10% chance of greater than four inches of snow when you're forecasting nothing, you know, as you're, as you're deterministic? And of course, you, you know, the real atmosphere does do that. Uh, you can lean towards a non-event, but that doesn't mean there's not a, you know, a, a one in 10 shot of a major, major snowstorm. Um, so I, you know, Jeff, I, I don't know if I'm sensing maybe that was one of the uncertainties, or I'm sorry, inconsistencies or perceived inconsistencies that we've heard uh, coming out of Central Region. Um, so I, I think this helps give some insight into that issue. Um, maybe we'll stop there and maybe validate if that is one of the inconsistencies that uh, you're, you're hearing about. Sorry, I'm on mute. Uh, I, perhaps we should revisit that um, after Phil presents. Uh, okay. It might, I think the it's actually the other side of the spectrum, I believe, that we're concerned about where we're, our deterministic forecasts, or in some cases, some of yours might have been close to being above the maximum. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to wait and, and see the details of, of, of what we present later, but now this this makes perfect sense to me that, that, that I think where we run into issues is if you're forty you're forty percent we're seeing some some things where you would expect the deterministic forecast to be closer to your forty percent probabilities and we're seeing occasionally things that don't seem to add up there but I would like to if you don't mind like to just proceed on and, and see sure. if we get some examples. Is that okay? Absolutely. So let's okay. proceed. How do I give this? Do I have to give this up? And how do I do that? And who do we go to next, Jeff? I would, I would go to Phil. Okay. And we'll go to Phil. Okay. Okay. It's, can you everyone can you hear, hear me? me? I can hear you, Phil. You sound great. Okay. Hey, I'm downloading right now the join me stuff, so it'll take a second before. Are you going to be able to just pull the screen from us then? I think so, yeah. Okay. That would be very good. We'll see what happens. Okay, yeah, I think you can see. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. I see you, Phil. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go through. Um, I'm just going to go through one case here. I do have a second case in the background if people want to see it, although it's not nearly as developed as this one. Um, and that's from November, which I've shared with a few people. Um, I'm going through the case from January 5th, 2015. And it, it's actually more, I say, differences in snowfall, QPF, and probabilities. It's not only. WPC, but it's also with the, the official forecast. And um, so um, this is just the event that occurred on Monday in, in the Northern Plains. Um, so unfortunately, I only have data mostly from my forecast area. I do include forecast information from Aberdeen, um, Minneapolis, and Des Moines as well. But um, you know, just the nature of trying to throw a talk together fast, I only have the stuff from us. So and I all the Usual rules apply with looking at one case. It's, you know, I can't say it's completely representative, but I think it does highlight some issues that, that I've noticed and, and I think others have noticed across the region. So just as a quick overview, um, this was an Alberta clipper system. It moved from western South Dakota into southwestern Iowa. On the day of the 5th, snow was expected to develop along a frontal band. Um, we were expecting an embedded band of higher snowfall rates where frontogenesis was maximized. Instability was minimized, and, and that was pretty much an uh, agreement amongst the offices of, with WPC as well. Um, so there was really no controversy on that part. Maximum QPF varied quite a bit 
um, for this system um, from about two tenths of an inch to five tenths of an inch um, maximum, um, at least over eastern South Dakota. Again, I'm not quite as sure what happened as it moved into Illinois and Indiana. Uh, the NAM was consistently the farthest north solution. The GFS was consistently the farthest south solution. And the ECMWF consistently had the lightest precipitation. And I think some of this stuff shows up a little bit And now that I know what the membership of the ensemble is that you're using. Watches and warnings um, across the region, or at least across the eastern plains, were issued for marginal warning snowfall, so around six inches, but also for high snowfall rates. So, and that's kind of one to two inches per hour. And so I certainly don't expect that we would have a, a complete one-to-one -one match between the W between the probabilities of six inches and the watches and warnings. But um, as you'll see, I think there should have been a little bit better. Um, so just to kind of clue everyone in, this was the snowfall that we actually got on that day, reported from co-ops, uh, cocoa Ross, and stuff like that. So generally, you had this area of four to seven inches, essentially, that came from northwestern Iowa, just north of Sioux City, up to, into southeastern South Dakota, basically back to Mitchell, and then, then north of Sioux Falls, and then basically along Interstate 90 in southwestern Minnesota. I did see reports in, in Iowa, down Des Moines area, down towards Fort Dodge, and, and stuff that was six to eight inches. And so, you know, it's pretty much a, an area of six to nine in, or five and eight inches of snow that really started getting going northwest of Sioux Falls and continued into Iowa. And I think it even got into the Bukes area at some point. So how I'm going to do this is I'm going to start at day three and go through day one. And so um, kind of going that way to kind of just go through the process a little bit. So what, first of all, I'm going to show is this is a day three forecast issued at 9Z on the third, essentially around 9Z. This is, on the left is a WPC forecast or WWD forecast, and on the right is a WFO forecast, and, and this is just using ISC and then smoothing. So, you know, really, actually, I think this is actually a very close forecast between WFO and WPC. Two inches going through Sioux Falls in both cases, just north of Huron, um, four inches in southwestern Minnesota, and then into southern Minnesota, and that's pretty consistent between both the WFO and, and WPC. So I think a fairly well-collaborated forecast. I mean, when you're within a half inch, I think you're doing pretty good. Um, so now what I've got up here is, I'm just, put, just to orient everyone, I've got the WPC um, QPF, and that is from the 12Z issuance, or what is marked as 12Z in GFE. So it would have been issued by the mid-shift. Um, then the, the WPC snowfall for the same six-hour period and then the WPC uh, on the bottom, the WPC um, SLRs. Um, so, for instance, it's a hundredth of an inch in Chamberlain, zero snowfall, 14.3 to one snow SLR um, for here. And then what I've done is uh, I calculated out for all these points what the snowfall would be, what the, the snowfall would be if I just took the SLR times the QPF. And if it was there's a difference of more than an inch between what WPC the WWD has and what the QPF would give me using the SLR, um, I've circled it in red. And so in this case, Brookings had a one inch difference. It was one inch higher um, in that case. Um, and then if I, so that was from 18Z to 60. So this is just in six hours. And if you go ahead six hours later, you can see that that continues in across nor our northern forecast area, I think, it, and also up by Watertown as well in Aberdeen's area. And I didn't calculate out to Minneapolis or Des Moines. So you can see there, there's a, a systematic error, error it's probably the wrong one, difference between the, the two forecasts. And when you calculate it out over time for the entire period that snow was forecast, um, in blue is the WWD forecast, in red is the QPF, if I use the QPF and the SLRs, and then the green is the difference, and then I pointed out the difference. And you can see there's quite a few stations just in our area that had a one to two inch difference. And that may not be a big deal if you're up at eight, nine, ten inches, but this is actually maximum snowfall predicted at this point was under four inches. So you're talking, uh, you know, 25 to 35 percent snowfall difference between the two forecasts. And, and where this can matter is that it can make it very difficult for us to try and match up at times if we use Q HPC or WPC, sorry, QPF as as a starting point, and, and as well as the um, 
uh, SLRs. Then the next thing I've got up here is the, the day three snowfall forecast. Again, on left is WPCs, right, is our, the WFO's forecast or NDFD if you want. And then on the lower left is the probability of four inches of snow, and on the right is the 50th percentile. And, and I think what struck me right off uh, is that, and it, Mark's talk kind of explained why this may be happening, but notice that the the, w, the 50th percentile is probably about half of what the actual forecast, WPC forecast and consequently WFO forecast is. For instance, in Sioux Falls, there's only a 50% chance that we'll get one inch of snow. The official forecast and the WPC forecast is two inches of snow. And when you go to the 75th percentile, which I have here, um, then you can see that there's a pretty good match. So the WPC forecast and the WFO forecast actually match up Oh, just wait. Match up best with the with the the 25th. There was only a 25% chance of the official forecast being met. I guess is what I'm saying, and and you know that I think might be an issue at times. Um, and then just the, another thing just to show up is the probability of four inches here. Here in red, I've highlighted where there was four to seven inches of snow. So you, there's also an issue with possible under dispersiveness of of the ensemble members itself. Um, given that Sioux Falls had six, five to six inches and was less than 1% chance at this point of having a four inch or greater snowfall. Um, hey, hey, Phil, can we explore this a little bit? In what? Yeah, just, just to, to hit this point a little harder here. Um, so the uh, most likely forecast, uh, the mode of the distribution is not the same as the 50th, 50th percentile. Um, yeah. So Right, so it, it is if you're if you have a normal distribution. If you have a skewed distribution, then indeed you do get these situations where the most likely forecast or the the peak of that PDF uh, is not in the middle. So your 50th percentile is, and your and your most likely forecasts will not be the same. So th you know that is, that's another common um, you know even among us, uh, even amongst our Facebook posts is, uh, posts I see and for coming out of WPC is a, uh, a common uh, misperception of, of probabilities and distributions. So just, just wanted to, to hit that point harder. Right. I, I, I agree. I understand that. I, I don't think the, the public understands that, and I don't think the expectation should be that, that the public understands that, um, and because that's pretty high-level statistics that we're talking here. Um, but, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I just want to, you know, I think there is a, a potential that the public does not understand that that's, that's what's going on here. So, um, but anyway, I'll go on. So, just according again, one thing I, I you know, I want to emphasize is that the WWD is not publicly available. The only thing that's publicly available is the percentile, the probabilities. So, according to the publicly available probability map, the day three WFO and WW forecast had less than a 25% chance of being reached. Um, and also, just as a kind of an equal thing, actual snowfall is outside the model spread in parts of South Dakota and Iowa as well. Um, that's a, probably a separate problem at this point. Um, so we'll go on to the two and a half day forecast. This was issued on the day shift on Saturday the 3rd. Um, blue is six inches here for those, probably most of you know that. The four inches is in the um, green here. WFO forecast, yellow is six. The peach color is eight. Um, again, you can see you know, where the WFOs were a little bit farther north than WPC. Um, the four-inch line is actually fairly close, um, yeah, at least around Sioux Falls and into northwestern Iowa. Uh, but, you know, a little bit different. But in overall, the, I think it's not too bad. It's, this is the one that's the farthest off, actually. But even this isn't that far different. Um, again, going through, same thing with the ratios. Um, starting 18 to 0 Z, you can see here an example of 8 hundredths of an inch QPF, no snowfall predicted. Um, so that led to a 1.2 inch difference. Um, similarly at, at Yankton, South Dakota, um, fairly similarly at, they had four tenths at Sioux City, um, and then also at Worthington as well. Um, and then if we go ahead to 6 Z, you can see much of the eastern part of our forecast area, and I would assume probably parts of Minneapolis and Des Moines as well had differences as well of greater than an inch in that six hour period. And so when you total it up again, you come out with several places that are one to two inches different between the QPF, what QPF would give you and what the WWD would give you. 
um, in that area. And, it, and in this case, it's actually at, in places taking you from advisory to warning level snow um, in some places. So, and in a few places as well, it's, it's a doubling almost. For, or actually, Chamberlain had no snow forecast in WWDs if QPF would give them 1.2 inches. So again, if we overlay, if we overlay the uh, probabilities again, you can see that uh, again the probability of four. 50% up to Brookings, 40% uh, or less here. Uh, the 40% maximum just east of Worthington, Minnesota, which is the blue dot there, where my cursor is. And then I just overlay the four inches again just to show it's kind of starting to come in line a little bit with what was actually observed. And we put up the 50th and 70th, 5th percentile. You can see, and, and as Dave pointed out, it, it is the mode is at the 75th percentile at this point. Again, the the, forecast, the WPC forecast lines up best with the 75th and not the 50th percentile. So again, both forecasts had less than a 50% chance of being exceeded um, at that point, met or exceeded. And just I wanted to also pull up the, the watch that was issued at this time. Um, this was both Minneapolis and us issued a watch at this point, five to seven for us, five to nine in Minneapolis's area. It was in the watch. Um, and then here's the lineup with the probabilities. And uh, I'm not going to go into whose forecast is right. That's a rabbit hole I'm not really going into. But the question becomes, is there a question about consistency in messaging? If you have a probability in a watch, such as in Marshall up here, of uh, less than 20%, and we have a watch out. And so, again, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I think it's a question that we need to discuss. Um, going ahead to day two, I'm going to probably pick up the pace a little bit. Um, again, you can see the two forecasts are fairly similar. Again, we go through the ratios. We have one difference here up by Marshall, and then a, a fairly large difference across the northeastern half of our forecast area by one inch or more. And again, when you total it up, you can see differences of one to two inches at several locations in our forecast area as well. Um, biggest difference being in Spencer, where it goes from just over four to just over six inches um, in, in that for that snowfall event. So again, if we overlay the, uh, the, the snowfall with the probabilities, again, um, the probability of six inches is around 40% maximum here. Uh, you've got the four inches at 50% runs up to Brookings. Sioux Falls is still right around 40% chance. There's the probability there, or the four inch area. And then when we pull up the percentiles again, we see a similar pattern where both the WFO and WPC forecasts are closer to the 75th percentile as opposed to the 50th percentile. Um, and again, so there was approximately only a 25% chance of, the, of the, snow, the official forecast being met or exceeded at that point. Um, and just to highlight, here's the watch that was issued on that shift um, from, for Des Moines, us, and uh, Minneapolis all had watches out. And I've overlaid the watch on here the probability, and, and I guess for me what's a little bit distressing is like on the, for Sioux Falls especially and down towards Storm Lake, Iowa, which is this point right here approximately, um, the probabilities are only 5% chance of reaching six inches. And well, we were between, we were around six here. I, again, it's, I think there's a question on, on is that a consistent message between what the watch is saying and if someone were to go look at the probabilities at that point. So going ahead to day and a half, Again, basically the orientation is the same between WPC and WFOs. WPC has a little bit higher snowfall than what we had, um, but you know, again, probably within an inch. Or, well, I think it's within two, two or three inches in the maximum around, around Spencer here, um, as well. Um, again, going through the, the uh, comparison, you can see across the northern part of our forecast area and eastern, there's an over an inch difference. And when you total it up, in this case, actually, the WWD forecast was higher than the QPF. This is the only example where that occurred. Um, but again, that difference ended up being by an inch to two inches in some, in some places. If you went by the QPF, only Worthington, Minnesota would have had over six inches. But if you go by the HPC forecast, there were several locations that were over six, a couple approaching eight inches at Spencer and Worthington. Um, and again, um, looking at the probabilities, you can see now we finally got 50 percentile um, in parts of Des Moines and our, in our area in northwestern Iowa. 
at six inches, and we're now over 80%, over four inches here, and over 50% now back into Sioux Falls as well. Um, and we pull up the probabilities. You can see actually the probability of the 50th percentile is fairly close, I would say, to the WFO forecast. The 75th percentile is probably closer to the WPC forecast in this case. So and that's kind of what I just said there. And, fi and finally, here's the watches and warnings that were issued. Um, Aberdeen went with the advisory. That's the purple area here. Us, the Minneapolis and Des Moines went with the warning and then surrounded it by watches yet because there was some uncertainty. And actually, I, I think the watch and the, prob the warning and the probabilities actually line up fairly well. They're basically 40 to 80 percent chance of exceeding six inches within the warning, and, and I think that's actually not too bad, especially, as I said, since this was a marginal event for snowfall, and we were partially warning on rates, high snowfall rates as well. Um, and finally, the day one forecast. Again, I think fairly good agreement between WPC and the FOs overall, um, both around six inches here, six to seven. Um, but again, when you look at the QPF, um, focusing in on the afternoon, there were pretty big differences which had to do with the FLR, actually, um, between the two, be between the QPF and the WWD. And when you total it up, once again, you end up with a lot of areas that are over an inch to two inches different between the two, of the two forecasts. Um, in fact, if you used the QPF, you'd be up towards nine or 10 inches in a couple of locations, Spencer and Storm Lake. Um, and then if we look at the probabilities again, you have the 50th percentile up to across from Storm Lake up towards Sioux Falls, uh, generally close to the six inch area there. Um, and if I overlay the, fifth, the 50th and the 75th, you can see that both the WPC and the, the official forecast are much closer to the 75th percentile looking wise than they are to the, 20, the 50th percentile. So, and, and again, here's the warning um, again, you know, generally 40 to 60 down here. It was a little bit less up here, although admittedly we were a little bit less certain about that part of the warning anyway. So, so finally, just in conclusion, um, first of all, there's discrepancies between the snow and the QPF coming out of WPC right now. The errors for us were one to two inches, and that was fairly common. And I would assume if I had gone into Des Moines and Minneapolis area, I'd probably seen similar differences. And you know, again, if you're up towards a foot, one or two inches may not matter, but when you're less than eight inches, and especially less than six inches, having one to two inch errors is on the order of 25 to 33 percent of the, of the total snowfall. And so that's a pretty large, in my opinion, that's a, a fairly significant error, and that can be a difference between whether you go warning or advisory at times or watch or whatever. Um, in many cases, I feel the snowfall probabilities, is in my opinion, were not indicative of either the WWD forecast or the WFO forecast um, at all, in, in many cases. Um, the one thing is that the watch collaborator would not have recommended a watch until 18 hours prior to the event. We actually, all three WFOs had issued warnings, had issued warnings by that point. Um, in fact, we issued our watches 30 to 42 hours in advance of the event. Um, but again, I should emphasize, we were issuing for both snowfall and snowfall rates, and obviously the watch collaborator is only for snowfall, um, and I understand that. Um, I would argue that should, the probability of exceeding the, ND, the WFO and DFD forecast should be at least closer to 50%, um, and maybe I, I understand the skewness issue and all that stuff, but, um, you know, I know the mo in the mode, but I think there's a thing where, where if people, the public sees it and they see that a forecast has a 20 or in the case of our watch here in Sioux Falls and, and down Storm Lake and parts of Northwest uh, down towards the Des Moines area where there's only a 5% chance of reaching your snowfall, I just think that that's sending a message that, we may, that, that there's a discrepancy between what's going, what we think is going to happen. Why do we have a watch out if there's only a 5% chance of getting six inches of snow? Um, and the other thing, and at, I I didn't see Mark's talk before this, but it appeared to me that WWD snowfall had little impact on the snowfall probabilities. Now, it appears they have more of an impact than what, what I thought, but it comes down to is that the snowfall that WPC puts out is not made available on the website, but the probabilities are. And if we're going to start collaborating, we need to collaborate in a way that affects the probabilities. Um, and if, if collaborating snowfall is not doing that for us, then we need, a new, uh, we need to figure out what we can collaborate with you guys so that 
so that we're affecting the probability so they come in line with the forecast that we're, we're putting out. Because as you saw here, I think the, the agreement between WWD and the WFOs was actually fairly good. Uh, you know, I'd say in most cases within a half inch. But the probabilities at times really did not match up the message that at least the WFOs were trying to send, that this was going to be a storm that, that could dump up the sections of snow and, and cause problems if someone was looking at both products. So I think uh, my final message is I think that the, it's leading to the appearance of an inconsistent message, and, and I guess that's what I, I'd like to have um, kind of discussed. Thanks. True. <laughs> That's a lot, Phil. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I thought I'd just provide a few comments here. It's the first time seeing this, but uh, a few comments, and then maybe we can dig into some of these some of these issues. Um, first, wow, is it amazing to actually get this kind of feedback and analysis? Um, this, as we're looking here, I don't think we've ever seen somebody uh, take a look at our products in, in this uh, type of uh, rigor. And uh, that's wonderful. I, you know, I, I'll go into my uh, FCS speak here, but it is an example of the power of an integrated field structure um, because they, I think you are raising some valid issues that perhaps we're kind of aware of, but maybe maybe not, or we can clarify some of the misperceptions. So listen, this this is wonderful analysis. Um, we certainly welcome uh, welcome it. I think a critical aspect here, um, there's a lot of issues here, but, but a critical aspect, the snow to liquid ratios were never really intended to represent our product. Um, as you saw there, it's a fixed ensemble membership, right? So let's say the forecaster on the winter weather desk is really going with uh, a non-incept solution. Those SLRs then really have limited relevance to what the snow forecast is. Um, the, you know, if you recall, the SLRs there were um, the rover technique applied to the GFS, rover technique applied to the NAM, a fixed ratio, and then uh, climatology. Um, so, I, you know, I'm trying to remember when we did, we even debated even releasing those, I remember. Um, but, uh, you know, I know there was interest in the field for, well, man, you've got the rover technique being applied there. You know, let's, we want to see that. So I don't know that we expected them. I, I don't know. I don't know if we expected the SLRs to be applied and then compared to our own forecast. Um, so that, that's kind of a major uh, difference of view of how, you know, I guess we didn't expect the SLRs to be used in that way and compared to our forecast in that regard. Um, so that's, that's a major point. Um, and then the, the final, uh, probably biggest thing that, um, well, not really. I mean, you brought up the probability thing. I guess I've got to cover that, too, here. Um, the, the, um, the, the consistency between the QPF and the snow, um, that's actually an area of intense uh, discussion here at WPC. Um, where we have uh, proposals uh, with staff here uh, really altering the workflow of our precipitation desk. I, I do have to say it, it's some trade-offs. Um, because of the resources, uh, you know, you basically have one person on each desk doing it across the nation, doing three days. You know, there, there are issues like disaggregation and the timing of different data sets. And so, you know, what we're preliminarily proposing um, is a package of QPF and snowfall that's internally consistent uh, but it's released at 18Z and 6Z, and no sooner than that. Um, and probably for Central Region, that's not too bad of an issue. For Eastern, that may indeed be an issue. Um, again, these, these are topics under discussion, but, um, you know, there, there are these trade-offs be between having consistency, but also that may mean you have to wait a little longer than what you're used to to get, say, that day one forecast of snow. So these are the uh, these are some of the issues, um, not for this season, but uh, we're kind of just gathering uh, facts such as what you're providing here, as well as uh, you know how that change may impact operations in each of the regions as well as here. Um, so that's you know so I expect we're still going to have these these issues throughout the rest of the season here until we can really uh, sync up our workflows uh, here internally as well as as with you. And then finally, on the probability aspect, um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, 
again, as you said, the deterministic forecast that we're providing is um, not public. Uh, the probabilities are. Um, as you saw, Mark did show that the deterministic forecast does have, uh, I would suggest, a pretty large influence on the probabilities. Um, it shifts the entire distribution. It kind of changes the whole distribution. So, um, but there's this balance between do you, you know, our deterministic forecast is, is again, the most likely scenario, but you also are trying to have deference to, you know, 58 uh, or 57 other uh, type of solutions that are out there. Um, in a probabilistic way. So there's this balance between how much weight do you put on the human deterministic forecast uh, and still retain reliability of your probabilities. Um, so that, that's the balance. Uh, perhaps, you know, we can look at that pendulum of which way it has to swing. But um, that, you know, as I was showing, at least for that brief analysis of reliability, if you had 100 of these events, those probabilities are pretty reliable. Uh, in the current state. Um, so, so again, uh, very much welcome the discussion and, and uh, analysis here, and I'll, I'll be quiet and uh, open it up for more discussion. If, uh, if you'll permit me, uh, since we're still lo loosely talking about snow to liquid ratios, uh, before we get too deep into the probabilities, would you permit me in letting uh, Dan Baumgart from La Crosse bring up some of his comments and suggestions on the snow to liquid ratio, and then we can circle back to this. Yeah, of course. Oh, okay. hey, before, oh, sorry, Jeff. Should I and give Phil, you guys Phil, back? If that's okay with you. Yeah, no, that's fine. I was just going to say, do you guys want back control? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm passing it to Dan right now. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks, John. Sure. Yeah, it's been. Um, I don't have anything uh, to formally present, um, but I'm glad okay. Phil presented this case because this is okay. the case that I worked on Saturday, and you know I, I think I am going to download since you're giving me that well, opportunity. Well, maybe in the meantime, here Dan Peterson had a uh, comment or question. Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, Phil, this is Dan Peterson. How you doing? Very good. How's it going, Dan? Pretty good. Um, thanks for all the examples, especially the the breakdown of period by period all the way through the forecast, really helpful to see how that worked out. Um, one of the proposals that I submitted to management here was we want to have the QPF forecast issued earlier so then we can go to the more of the central region approach where we'll take the QPF, multiply it by the six hour snow ratio and come up with the snow amounts. Because right now I'm composing the snow forecast before the six hour QPF comes out and that's what's causing these to be staggered from one another. And that's a problem we have to solve. And just wanted to say thanks for uh, make that illustrated very clearly. Yeah, yeah, no problem. You know, and and I think you know, Dave mentioned about the change in workflow. I think you know, as we go through it, we also have to figure out a way that you know the FO still can um, work with, collaborate with you guys before the official product is sent out, if it's 18Z and 6Z um, or whatever. Yeah. So, so, I think so that's maybe part let, me, of let me just. Uh, point out that so the deter the idea here is that that 18z and 6z are that kind of initial not what the public sees it's what you see and then we have the uh, collaboration and then i guess it's what 21z and uh, 9z uh, are the final what goes out the public um, uh, you know updated so um, yeah so we want to retain that uh, aspect the particular collaboration window roughly between 18 and 20Z and 6 and 8Z. Again, just a proposal under discussion. Yeah, I have a question that might be a little crazy, but should the WWD be using the mode instead of the 50th percentile? Do you think that would make more sense? Uh, for the, uh, yeah, there's uh, quite a debate. If you want to get statisticians going uh, with what the most likely, I guess the mode defined is the most likely. So that's you know that's how we define our deterministic forecasts are the most likely scenario. So yeah, I, no. I think the statisticians will tell you most. Let's say 70% of statisticians will tell you yes, it is the mode, not the not the 50th percentile. Well, that, that's part 
probably true. The mode is the most likely in terms of at that value, but the probability of exceeding or not exceeding a value is actually at the 50th percentile. Yeah, I, when we get back into this, I think I, I do think that fundamentally, as we go more into probabilistic forecasting and confidence, and we've we've started to really educate our customers that we put out. HWOs at 30 percent and watches at 50 percent and warnings advisories at 80 percent. This is a big deal that we make sure we're all on the same page. And your skewness may be a running before we even started crawling kind of thing. And we might, but but I think before that we should let Dan talk about uh, his uh, his input on the SLR. But this this is a big deal, and I'm hoping we can uh, address this further in the coming months uh, as we discuss it. Anyhow, Dan, take it away. Well, I, I don't want to interrupt. I mean, m my issue that I want to raise is, is a simple issue compared to some of these other bigger issues. Um, you know, I, I work Saturday, and, and we were dealing with the same storm and snow ban that, that Phil was, was describing, and, and Dan Peterson, I think you were on that day, and um, but not on that desk, maybe, as from what I recall. But so we had a situation, and can you see my screen here with the SREF dendritic growth zone there? Sure can. Okay, so there was a fairly deep with with Phil's band and coming into our band into Davenport. Um, there was a really deep dendrite growth zone. It was nearly 400 millibars, three to 400 millibars deep. Um, and so there was this signal for a maximum snow ratio on that band. Um, and when I contacted um, WWD desk that um, that morning, right out of the gates we were on the same page. You know, this is going to be a higher ratio event. We, you know, we can't stick with our our normal ratios on this one. So then I looked at our um, now I'm aware that WPC issues a number of snow ratio grids uh, for us, but when I looked at the W, what, what is our quote unquote WPC grid, I saw a grid that that looked very much, you know, more like this type of a grid. Um, and this is surface based from the SREF, but I, I just guess I want you to focus on the gradient of it. It had higher ratios to the north toward the colder air. Uh, and the standard decreased towards the southwest and toward the warmer air. Um, and that was, and, and so what I guess I was curious about, and, and I guess Dan helped me with this a little bit on that shift, but what you all are sending is that, that four, that four part arithmetic mean between Rober, Rober, uh, Baxter and and uh, and 11 to 1, I think it is, whatever it may be. But that's the snow ratio grid that you are distributing that we see, but it's not the one that's used in your forecast. In fact, we don't have a way to see the snow ratio that is used to produce the WWD graphic and what may turn out to be the operational deterministic forecast from the WWD desk. Is that correct? It's a bit of a confusing question because um, each member of that ensemble indeed does use that uh, Rober, Rober, Climo, Baxter as the snow look ratio. Sounds Looking like at Dan awesome. pretty intently here. He's, he's assuring me that's the case. Um, so, uh, so the guidance that we get is that ratio. And right. so but the human the human forecaster can, you know, augment that, can adjust well no 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 can augment their their amounts. They don't augment they don't you're not editing snow to liquid ratios. They are not editing snow to liquid ratios. So okay. there's kind of this this different forecast process, you know, between it sounds like what Central Region is doing, you know, where you do your QPF, you edit your snow liquid ratios and the snow falls out. Whereas right. here it's you're basically editing no, and QPF, and period. And we don't edit the ratios. And, ratio. and they right. explicitly do not edit the snow to liquid ratios. Um, 
and and perhaps this was just poor advertising about what that you know what those grids are. Um, again, it was you know we got requested that they wanted you know wanted to see the rover information uh, getting out there, so that's how they were provided. But but you know if you want our SLRs, you just divide the snow by the QPF and or the QPF by the snow. That is our SLR then. Well, it is if they're consistent, right? If they're done on the same desk. Once you have that come together, right? Because right now that's that's separate. So I can get your SLR, but it's gonna. I'm not sure it's gonna be the SLR that was used to produce the snow, if you will. If I, you know, because yeah, they're not. It's point. not we apples and apples. We don't edit SLR. I can't do we that. I can't do that. That's that's like crossing the streams. <laughs> so, again, you're, you're right, Dave. What, what most forecasters are going to do is a QPF times a SLR. And it sounds like you, get, you might get a first guess snow from that and then you adjust your snow your deterministic snow forecast not Correct. necessarily adjusting QPF or SLR and then and then once you're done with that it becomes the mode in the probabilistic distribution and then you you're amazingly done. have followed that is correct i know it is it can be confusing but, but that, but that, that is correct so so yeah, and so here, here's here's the challenge, as I see it. And let's just start with the big picture. Big picture is we we have consistency issues between WFOs and issuing snow. We have consistency issues between what we put out and what WPC puts out. So we can. We can go down the road of trying to fix the WFO, QPF, and SLR guesses, and but when you know, and and, I, and again, we've got mostly Sues on the call here, and W. The, the the issue to me becomes a people issue if we're saying that there's inconsistencies, but then if they see the forecasters see inconsistencies. In your product suite, trying to get us to embrace the partnership is harder, and I, I, I'm, I'm struggling as I listen to all this on how do, how do we, how do we get there when there's going to be perceived inconsistencies? Um, I, I'm, I'm struggling. So that, that's going well, to be. I think, a, I think I can help. Uh, I think you can help WPC, and WPC can help you. Um, you know, one again, this intense uh, negotiation and discussion of our workflow here, workflow changes, uh, is to help address certainly the QPF snow consistency. Um, that's that's certainly one aspect of this. Um, but there are trade-offs, uh, particularly for Eastern Region. I have to say. <laughs> You know where they would get that information later than they perhaps need. Um, so you know this is the struggle. Um, so again, I, I I think the future is bright for next season. Uh, for this season, I do know the winter weather desk forecasters and QPF forecasters now are certainly talking more than they ever have, uh, trying to avoid uh, presentations like uh, Phil's. <laughs> okay, so. Um, you know, know that your feedback matters, and we are, you know, really making some serious uh, considerations here. Um, I, I think it's just going to be an evolution, Jeff. I don't think it's going to be overnight. I think it's an evolution. No, I, I, I agree, and I, I, I appreciate that. Now, circling back to the probabilities, and I, for, I for one, you know, Phil's presentation is a, is an excellent description of what many of us have seen in terms of the probabilities. And the thing that, again, the thing that concerns me about we have the wa you have the watch collaborator which focuses on 50 percent 
probability of exceedance, which is fine. I, I, I do, I do struggle mightily. We might, we might, we we might want to rethink the skewness, and, and the re, and I think it's, I think the skewness is a, is a more advanced state of probabilities than I think forecasters are even comfortable with, let alone users. And it also brings up another issue which I was losing sleep over a few weeks ago. We've been tell telling customers that we issue warnings and advisories at 80% confidence. Well, 80% confidence of what? And, uh, and here's my problem. 50% for watch is easy. Six inches of snow, probably about a 50% chance, so you can lean on a watch. So what is a 80% chance of six inches? Well, it's probably not a deterministic forecast of six inches. It's probably more like eight or nine, just as a example. I'm not sure we're actually doing that now. Uh, I don't know if any others agree, if I'm expressing my concerns right but if you truly have an 80 percent chance of exceeding criteria your deterministic forecast is probably high higher than your threshold so I I I'm not sure I'm sure I think we're thinking we're a little being a little bit too complex if we end up with a distribution which may be scientifically valid that there's only a 5% chance of exceeding six inches, but I have to side pretty strongly with, with Phil at this point that we're going to, if we're actually truly transitioning into a probabilistic world, we're going to, we, we need to do it a little bit more simplistically to start. Um, but may, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe, this is the way we should do it, and and, it, and it's very eloquent what you're doing. But I am concerned, and I, I don't. I'd, I'd like others to weigh in because I don't want to dominate that. But um, I see Ken Cooks on the call. Ken, what do you think? <laughs> Man, why are you doing that to me? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean. <laughs> I mean, I have the same type of concerns. I mean, I think we're early in this process as far as uh, talking about it. I think it's good, but, uh, I mean, I, I definitely resonate with what you're saying. I mean, it's it's a mixed message we're saying, uh, you know, especially with probabilities, and, and we can get talked into, into the probability discussion about those numbers later as far as how they're derived in that. But, you know, we're telling somebody there's an 80% chance of something happening more or less with a headline, and then we they go look at a graphic and it says, 40%, but I mean, those are two different probabilities in my mind. We're 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 looking at a confidence factor of what we expect. That's a derived probability using using an empirical value. So that either has to be collaborated or we've got to change our thinking. I put everybody to sleep. Josh was on the call. Josh, what do you think about the, the the probability issues that Phil raised? Well, they're they're definitely an issue. Um, we we've gotten lucky up here in that we haven't tied any of our um, automated um, threat levels to those probabilities. We've kept it based on the actual GFE grids. So by doing that, we're not advertising the inconsistency. But, you know, now with social media, if you guys were tweeting out an image of that, I'd be getting calls, and, and uh, our ERS would be getting calls, and, and our WCM and MIC. So. I think it's something that needs to be looked at, and even, the, you know, true probabilities don't help anybody except us, and um, that that sort of gets, uh, 
we open Pandora's box the moment that we take it outside of the uh, of the automated, or I'm sorry, of the uh, of the password protected site, and make that available to our super users. And I, I'm sure that they can derive information from that, but when it's inconsistent with our watch, then it undermines the, the entire um, impact-based uh, headline or warning or watch system. Um, so I, I do think it's a problem, and I, I love that Dave is, is willing to take this on in sort of an iterative uh, um, process, j just moving it forward, but we're just going to continue to see these cases over and over and over. Um, and eventually, people are going to latch on to those graphics, and it's, it's going to be a slap in the face instead of a, a presentation from inside the weather service. It's going to be a discussion on Washington Post. Anyone else want to? To weigh in, I, I can I can pick on some others I know. Hey, hey Jeff, is, I'll go ahead. Matt, I have a few thoughts. Um, as far as the outward-facing probabilistic graphics, I, I saw some of the presentation. I think Mike Fowle shared them with the the Dakota Sioux that he got when he was at uh, WPC uh, several winter weather presentations. But there is one t um, presentation that talked about the the most probable, the the least you know, the, the least impact and the highest impact. And I think maybe giving all the, these probabilities to the users isn't necessarily the best thing or what they want. But if you gave the, the fifth percentile, which you could not call that, but say, you know, the, the lowest, the least likely amount of snow and the 95th percentile, the most likely, and then give the mode and say that the most likely outcome, that would be better, I think, for a public-facing website. And then um, we won't have to worry about that sort of thing causing confusion when those posts are made. Um, and then another thought is, as I kind of brought this up earlier, that the WWD internal product, uh, I think that should be made, if it isn't already, the, the mode of the most likely instead of the 50th percentile. That might help uh, with collaboration. And then finally, I just have a question in, in that what what is the goal here in terms of the national snowfall versus the WFO. Is it, I mean, should we be 100% taking what is in WWD and just use that? Should, you know, and if not, well then what's, you know, what's the amount of deviation? Or should we be saying, well, hey, we, we really need, you should have six more inches of snow on the Black Hills, for example, make sure you update that and then we update that. I don't think this is really clear. It's like we're on, the two were on the same team, but one's like a, a, a practice team and one's the official team. And, and so, what you know, how how is it really supposed to mesh together? You know, what's the goal? What should we be doing? But so, um, and just some of the thoughts I had after listening to the discussion. Well, I think that the days of I, I still feel that we have to we have to iteratively step towards one forecast, and we're not going to be doing that this winter, and maybe not even next winter. But personally, I think the world has changed such that there's not going to be two forecasts down the line. We're going to, you know, my vision is that we that we collaborate with. WPC and a forecast goes out, and we both use the same forecast. Now, that, again, that's not going to happen overnight. Um, but it it seems to me that we have local expertise to to add to the national, and the WPC has the national expertise to try to do their best to get the, you know, we we struggle with storm tracks, and that's kind of what they're really helping us with is to to settle in when there's uncertainty on the on the on the heart of the storm and then we have expertise with lake enhancement with terrain that we can add to the picture 
how, and again, it's going to take time, but the only way we're going to get to one forecast is if we start learning to work together routinely instead of independently the way we've been doing it for years. How do we do that know, efficiently? Dave, if, Dave, if that's the vision you share, but that's, that's kind of the vision that many of us have been talking about. Um, yeah, I, 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 I agree, Jeff. Um, just, if I could just intervene, uh, at AMS, uh, still this week, I guess, geez, uh, had a conversation with a group of Western Region Sioux, Andy Stern, um, Eli Jacks, and talking about this probabilistic uh, precipitation issue, and, and I guess um, uh, particularly Jeff Craven and um, uh, Josh Sheck, you would you would know uh, you're aware of the FY15 process where we've got a group of SUs identified, you know, from the different regions working with WPC, in this case on extreme rainfall. Uh, what we were talking about was for FY16, again, a group of interested folks to really dig into this probabilistic challenge for the Weather Service. Uh, you know, group of field folks, perhaps some policy folks, to really dig into this and uh, come to some. Uh, agreement on these really uh, sticky issues. So, um, you know, there is some structure, I guess, that's trying to be uh, and resources put to this in terms of a full National Weather Service uh, answer to how are we going to do probabilistic precipitation forecasts. Hey, David, Again, that's just that's just a proposal at this point. It, it hasn't. Uh, it's it's really a month's discussion right now in the AFS portfolio. Um, but if you do agree with that, I would share that you know up through your region. Hey, Dave, this is Chris Strager, and uh, I guess I, uh, if I heard you say that we're planning that for 16, why do we have to wait till 16? <clears throat> I know money and time and resources and everything, but I, I think this issue is going to come back to haunt us before then. And if there's any way that we can get started before that, I'd like to see us take the lead. For what, whatever we have in Central Region, we're, we're willing to help however. So um, we stand by. And, uh, yeah, uh, I, you know, and honestly, Eastern Region, as you're aware, Chris, you know, has been uh, doing some efforts. Western Region's been doing some efforts. Southern Region's yeah. been doing some efforts. Um, so, yeah, the time, it, it's probably past time to, to really be looking at these, these uh, different efforts because we are all starting to go off in different directions. And, and that, that's, that's what worries me, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I agree. Uh, to the experts on the phone is, is to if they agree with that. I, I know there's an awful lot on everybody's plates, but this is a, an important topic. Well, um, does does anyone else have uh, something that they want to add? And I know I kind of Phil, I kind of cut you off at the end of your presentation to let uh, Dan talk. Did you do you feel like you have any other comments about what you presented that you'd like that we haven't uh, discussed enough? No, I, you know, I th I think we went over that pretty well. Um, I, you know, I've, I I guess I just want to make sure that that uh, I guess what I perceive as a, a split message. Is, or inconsistent message is understood, and it appears it is. And, you know, I'm certainly willing to help out if I can. And one, and one thing, you know, l let's face it, WPC and SPC have really tried to blaze the trail into probabilities. So, I, you know, I don't want this to come across as a, as a negative. I, I, I really think it was eloquent that you, how you, tried to adjust the probability distribution with your deterministic forecast and I don't so I don't want it to come off negative but it I'm just we're just trying we're struggling to try to I think the weather service forecasters have have struggled to actually calibrate themselves I mean it gets down to warnings I mean when do you put out a tornado warning what what is the probability of a tornado before you put out a tornado warning. And we're just starting to, to really look closely at these calibrated ensemble distributions and 
so we're struggling on, on, on what, what, what does it really mean when you have a 40% chance of four inches of snow. And I just want to make sure that we all have the same vision of what these actually mean. And it does, I think it does, it, will, it would concern, you know, we're mostly Sue's here talking on this call. Most of my forecasters would have the exact same reaction to Phil's concern that there's a watch out with less than a 1% chance of, of four inches of snow. They would say that's absurd. And I just, it would be hey, hard Jeff. for me to sell that to them at this point as, well, that's just the way that the ensemble distribution fell out. So I just want to make that concern made that it, it, it may be correct but it, it's, it's a hard sell. It's hard for us to understand that in our current state of probabilities. Hey, hey Jeff, I, I guess one comment I would make after I've been thinking about this is we're, we may somewhat be mixing apples and oranges here in that we aren't really issuing warnings based on a specific number or criteria anymore. We're, we're dealing with an impact-based warning, and that, that's just not severe. That's across the board. So how, I guess one thing we're going to have to do is reconcile when we're dealing with a watch warning headline, what does that mean in the context of impact when it comes to probabilistic amounts? Those aren't always going to match, and so we have to reconcile that. Yeah, that, that is an excellent point. Um, but even even saying that, I I still I still think that we that if that our in our inconsistencies aren't going to improve on a lot of the things we do unless we try to calibrate this. But I I I, am, I know it is, it is somewhat of a apples and oranges, but we all we all know that some people issue a tornado warning at a 5% probability and others at an 80 and that whether that's a you can argue that that's an impact but <laughs> it to me it's still a source of inconsistency and yeah i mean things, we need to we need to iron out the inconsistency i mean i completely am on board with that i just we have made a lot of progress in the agency in the last number of years of getting the people that are you know it's uh, you know, we have a heat index of 109 one hour and, and, you know, 104 for eight hours, but that doesn't meet criteria types, to finally getting them over the edge to drinking the Kool-Aid of, of you got to deal with the impact. And I just want to be careful that we don't damage that progress. Understood. You know what I'm there? But, but let's say we took Phil's example of rate. What, you know, we we have these nice calibrated SREF probabilities of one, two, or three inches an hour on the SPC site. Mm -hmm. So let let's say we switch away from a six inch to well, what's the probability at rush hour of inch an hour snows? We still want to calibrate that from office to office, don't we? Oh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and, and, and Jeff and, and Chris Strager in this regard, I mean, I do think, you know, there are a variety of issues here, and I think you can see, you know, calibration is an issue, uh, impact-based versus objective probabilities is another aspect, um, what, what those thresholds are perhaps. Um, but, you know, so I think you could see how you do need a group of, uh, you know, different folks to kind of come together and kind of subject matter experts as a weather service on this topic and, and help address. So um, I, well, one of the main points that Jeff's making here, too, is calibration. And, and I, I think in the end, you still, regardless of, you know, DSS messaging and such, you, as Jeff is saying here, the foundation is a calibrated probability. And in this particular case, because ensembles have errors, because humans have errors, because we don't, don't post-process, there, you know, there was no chance of more than uh, how much snow that actually fell in that case that Phil was showing us. And you know you're still gonna. It's imperfect still. But but um, so you know it's not perfect. But through verification, we need to find out. Well, how perfect is it? Is it pretty reliable? If it is, then just one case 
you know, isn't going to, it's got to be a number of cases, you know, through time where you show the reliability that 40% actually means 40%. So, you know, verification is a key aspect, um, and then just kind of the understanding even that, even with that, it's not going to be perfect. Hey, Jeff, this is Pat. Um, I think the, the idea, you know, of verification and, and all that is, is good and making sure that we can calibrate things. Um, and towards the end, though, we also have to make this stuff so that the public has some clue as to what we're trying to tell them. And, and mm -hmm. I think that's a big part of this. When, when I'm looking at the website, you know, sure, I can understand that, but I don't know if, you know, one of my brothers would be able to really determine what, what is this really telling me? What are the chances and, and how does that then work into you know, the chances of a winter storm watch are getting six inches. What's what's the chance of that? Because we have people now who calibrate our percentages and make their decisions based upon those types of percentages for rain. I mean, you know, neighbor takes the flag down when there's a 40% chance of rain or something. So there's, there's lots of different things that uh, I think that as we move on and we start to calibrate this stuff that we should think about bringing in the social scientists to try and help us, what's the best way to put this out there? Because, you know, 95%, is that a 95% chance we're going to get two inches of snow, or is it, you know, the 95 percentile? And there's, I think there's just things that we need to look at once we get into, into this calibration, how can we present this? So I want to just kind of thinking off the top of my head. I want to circle back to Chris's question about expediting this. Now, Mike Bodner just put out a nice invite for these daily briefings at the in the Weather Winter Experiment. Is some of this information going to be discussed on a, on a daily basis in that? that, that where we could start to use that to leverage brainstorming for how we can we can get we can I, I get think a, uh, I think that will be very interesting but uh, it's not focused on this particular topic um, I don't know that that's the, the right for, forum for that um, we'll be showing you know some of the new data the stress the the EMC what uh, NARI I guess it is and um, Day four to seven outlook type of information, uh, experimental stuff. There but it's, it's um, there might be a little bit of that discussion just with probabilities in general, but um, uh, it's a little bit different purpose. Um, okay. Cause but but I certainly encourage you to attend if you're if you're interested. The the second idea would be, you know, we've had a well established probability team in Central Region that's been working a different issue, uh, and Ken and Phil, I believe, are on that team. Is, that, is this something where we could refocus your team that's already established, which actually is multi-regional, uh, to, to, to this problem? I mean, how do you guys feel about changing gears? Uh, we're not. Real, we're waiting on the cart now, seemingly forever. So <laughs> we might as well change gears. I, that's just for me. I mean, Phil, and if Greg's on here, we can. And TJ and Al. I mean, uh, I don't have an issue with that. I don't have an issue. I mean, because obviously, yeah. <laughs> and and you've been working the probabilistic QPF and snow issue. On the from the deterministic forecast, mm -hmm. I, it, to me the to me the way we're going to solve this problem is the sooner we can get to WPC sends out their first guess and then we collaborate with them before they put out the final guess and then we both use the same deterministic forecast, the the quicker the problem gets solved. Now. How we can do that before next winter, Chris? I, I don't. I, I'm just being a realist here. I, I don't see it. 
but we can if we start moving in that direction, it would make it easier to make it happen next fall. I, I think, Jeff, like you said, starting to move in that direction would would be a good thing. Whatever we can do uh, would would be a good step. Well, we're we're an hour and a half into this. Uh, anyone else want to bring something up here that we haven't talked about or add on before we – I think we should probably wrap up. I know it's been a long day. Uh, it's always a long day for Dave. I'm sure he was heavily involved in today's morning meeting and among all the other 20 hats he's wearing. And we haven't even talked about the blender today. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy is working on some slides right now for our Tuesday call, by the way. So, oh, okay. Uh, really, Great. really appreciate you putting this together. We're all working super hard, uh, absolutely. And uh, again, this is just the start of a dialogue. By the way, I, I've really, I've really enjoyed the day four to seven product. I think it's a, it's a neat, it's a neat start. So. If there isn't anything else, uh, uh, Mark Klein and Phil and, and Dan, thanks for your thanks for your presentations and everybody at WPC. We appreciate you engaging and uh, look forward to more discussions like this. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. All right. Yeah. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.